DBA program has existed here? How long ago? Yeah. What's the DBA program for the doctor of administration? How long <laughs> what, has it been here? Like, do you know how long it's been here? Well, it's just come. I mean, you know, are you talking about the PhD or the DBA? The DBA. The DBA, the DBA is new. That one starts. I think next year they're enrolling students for the first time. So it's brand new. But it's not for you. It's for mid-level executives who want to turn retread and become professors in a second career or want to go into senior jobs in management. That's so the cool. people that are in that program are people that are like, you know, 35, 36, 37, and maybe 45, looking for a second career or looking for you know, heavy duty analytical skills. Ready to go? Ready. Let's do it. Well, Brian, let me go back to where I was. And like I said, this is not for you to write all this stuff down. Some of this stuff is for you to write down. I got a slide, but I'm going to get through as much of this as I can before the end of the semester. I've got three days to do it. And now I have 10 minutes more. <laughs> I did most of the structure stuff um, on Monday, so let me finish up some of the things that you need to know. What you're really learning here, and the part about structure that you need to know is the stuff that's related to the development of electronic communication networks in 2006, 2007, 2008, and to understand where those things came from and how they evolved to replace physical exchanges you got to understand a little bit of the history of the market, which is why we're talking about market structure today. We're going to talk about the history of the market in terms of physical trading. So that's some of the stuff that I was talking about the other day. And again, let me come back to where I was. That was the stuff we were talking about. Those are my notes to myself to make sure that I cover those things. So we talked about the modified auction market. We talked about a central limit book. We talked about the super dot as an electronic communication system or you know, a technology infrastructure that allows people to communicate on the floor of the exchange and throughout the intermarket trading system that you're going to learn about today. And that's on the physical market side. On the, quote, on the NASDAQ side, we talked about market makers. We talked about the Quotron system. We talked about SelectNet and SOS. SOS is an acronym for the Small Order Execution System. That's the external point of entry for broker-dealers into the market makers in the NASDAQ. Uh, and I haven't talked about Quotron levels of access yet, and that's something you've got to understand. And again, this is in the book, so I'll cover it relatively quickly. There are three access levels in a Quotron system, level one, level two, and level three. Level one gives you the highest bid and the lowest ask in the market, so it gives you the best spread in the market. I don't know anybody that pays much attention to a Quotron 1 terminal, except in the old days, that was a way that you could get a quote if you wanted to know what a stock was selling for in the market, you went to a Quotron 1. Most people use Quotron 2, so Quotron 2 shows you all of the market makers who make a market in a particular stock and what their bid ask spread is at that particular moment. You can't trade in a Quotron 2 environment, but you can see what's going on in the market when you look at a Quotron 2. Back in the old days, if you remember the investment center that was down at First Union, which is now One Wells Fargo, which is just off the lobby across from the YMCA, they had three or four Quotron 2 terminals in there. That when I taught this course, I used to have you go down there when you were down there and take a look at a Quotron 2 so you could see what one of these terminals looks like. A Quotron 3 terminal is a Quotron 2 that permits online electronic trading. And so you've got to be a licensed broker-dealer to have access to a, ter a level 3 terminal. But a level 2 terminal and a level 3 terminal are identical except for what you can do with them. Why is that important? Because essentially, if you look at different stocks and the way different securities are traded, different numbers of market makers trade different kinds of stock. Like at Bank of America, if you put BAC into a Quotron terminal, bang, you're going to see there are about 35 or 36 market makers, or there used to be, that would be making a market in that stock at any one point in time. On the other hand, if you put like us, you are a capital in our ticker is UWHR. I mean, I think we have three or four market makers that make a market in our stock. Our average daily volume is like nothing. I mean, you know, we might trade a thousand shares one day and we'll go a few days and don't trade anything and then we'll trade 500 shares. I mean, it's a real thinly traded stock. We only really have 7 million shares outstanding. On the other hand, Bank of America with 11 billion shares outstanding. 
trades in the neighborhood of maybe 50, 60, 70 million shares a day. So it's worth it for market makers to maintain an inventory in that stock and stand ready to buy and sell from that inventory at the bid-ask spread that they quote, which is why you see more market makers on bigger companies, you see narrower bid-ask spreads. As I told you the other day, a typical bid-ask spread on a stock like Bank of America, they're at what, 2045 in the low 20s right now? So it'll run maybe 2020 20 to 45, that's the kind of quote you get in a bid ask spread. 2020 is the bid, and then 2045 is the ask. And the way you communicate that spread is to say 2020 to 45. That's the way people talk in the market. You don't repeat the 20 when the integer stays the same on the ask side. So you get maybe. Uh, I don't know, 15 cents, 20 cents, 25 cents is a typical spread for a large company that's active. On the other hand, if you look at our stock, we're at 571. I mean, if you look at the spread there, it'll run a buck. I mean, you know, the difference between the bid and the ask will be about a dollar. So it varies from company to company. And when you look at a Quotron system, the colors indicate what's happening to the securities. When you see a color go from neutral to green, that means that the bid went up or the ask went down. On the other hand, when you see it go red, that means you've got a falling market. So the bid and the ask are falling. I think I said it incorrectly a minute ago. The bid and the ask are rising on a green, they're falling on a, on a red. And so when you look at an active stock in a moving market, you're going to see the colors are changing as the market makers alter their position in response to what's going on in the market. And you can feel the market adjusting price like you can't feel when you look at a screen here and get like an INET quote, which I'm going to show you in just a minute, an instant quote out of you know, the internet, which is the where the quotes used to come from on the internet. Now they come from ECNs like Archipelago. But the basic idea is you'll see one go green. In a moving market where you've got a stock rising, you'll have maybe 20 market makers shown on a series of two screens. It's going to take two screens to show that many bid ask spreads. And you'll see one go green, and you'll see a couple more go green, and you'll see everybody go green. And it kind of happens within a couple of seconds where you see active market makers adjusting their price to reflect the fact that the value of the stock is moving up. There are other times when market makers Makers make mistakes. So you'll see one of the colors turn to green and nobody does anything. And then the one that turned to green just turned to red. They bring it right back down again. So, you know, there's some judgment involved in terms of how the market moves and how market makers adjust and change their spreads. You need to understand that to understand so's bandits because if you make a mistake, you get hit with a so's bandit from outside the market. I gave you an article that talks about this. Or essentially, if I'm a market maker and I adjust too quickly and I up the price, then I get a bunch of sell orders that come into my particular station. And if nobody else marks my price, matches my price in the market, I wind up having to sell out my inventory at a, or having to buy at either a higher price if people are selling into me instead of having them there too. So anyway, that's the way the Quotron system works, and you're going to need to know that to understand some of the things you're going to see a little bit later. A couple of things you want to flag for your notes to remember to learn as you see these things come up because they're important to the evolution of the market. Number one, Rule 390. Rule 390 was established back in 1979 based upon a request, although I don't think you can consider it a request, I think Congress at the time was essentially telling the securities market to come up with a central limit order book, but they couched it as being a quote request, unquote, to the New York Stock Exchange to find a way to create central limit order books within the confines of the physical exchanges. And so back in 1975, Congress and the SEC realized, and they realized a long time before 75, but they really didn't act on it until 75, that a central limit order book, which is called the CLOB, obviously, you know, the idea is promotes a narrowing of spreads because it consolidates different specialists' <coughs> limit books across different exchanges. Remember, there's a difference between the specialist system and the market maker system, which is why I slowed down a minute ago. 
In a specialist environment, you have a monopoly on the securities that you trade. So there's only one specialist, that's Wagner, Scott, or Cater, that trades Bank of America. Well, they were acquired by Bayer and later acquired by B of A. So B of A essentially makes a market through its own people on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange for the shares that trade there. But there's only one place, one specialist in the New York Stock Exchange where the stock trades. That's not the way NASDAQ works. And NASDAQ, as many market makers as are interested in making a market in the security, can make a market. And so the basic idea is the New York Stock Exchange had one limit book, but remember, there were other physical exchanges as well. There was the American Exchange, and at the time, there were 13 regional exchanges. Back when physical exchanges dominated trading, there were 13 different regionals in the U.S., and that wasn't too many years ago. That was only about 15 or 20 years ago. And so essentially, Congress and the SEC went to the New York Stock Exchange and said, we want you guys to clean this up. We want a central limit order book because it improves the efficiency, operational efficiency of the market. Remember when we talked about operational and informational efficiency, operational efficiency is when buyers get the best price, which means the ask is as low as it can be, sellers get the best price, which means the bid is as high as it can be by the market maker, and so the spreads narrow in a more operationally efficient market. Well, in the 70s, things moved slower than they moved today. The New York Stock Exchange told Congress and the SEC, uh, let us think about it, we'll get back to it. <laughs> well, they came back in 1979 with this thing called the Intermarket Trading System. And they did that on purpose. They bled this and dragged this thing out as long as they could, because when you collapse the spreads with a central limit order book, who are you hurting? Well, you're penalizing the specialists because you're making their profits smaller because their gross margin goes down. You can look at a bid-ask spread just like a gross margin in retail. The difference between a wholesale and a retail price. But the New York Stock Exchange was extremely clever. There are really bright people that work in institutional finance. The brightest minds in this industry are always in institutional finance because that's where the money is. And so the basic idea is these guys came back to the SEC and they said, okay, here's our proposal. We're going to create this thing called the Intermarket Trading System, which they did create. The Intermarket Trading System took the limit book for the New York Stock Exchange, the American Stock Exchange, and the 13 regional exchanges, and it consolidated it into one book. And so that gave the SEC and Congress what they were looking for, a central limit order book, and improved the efficiency within the market. But notice, who is notably absent from that list of exchanges that I just gave you? And the answer is NASDAQ. Remember, NASDAQ was founded in 1969. By the time you get into the decade of the 70s, NASDAQ is sort of this pissant startup market that's from little companies that nobody ever heard of that are kind of fly-by-night in nature. But at the same time, the New York Stock Exchange saw that over time that electronic kind of market was likely to grow. So what they did was they shut NASDAQ out of the ITS, which guaranteed that you'd get better pricing from the New York Stock Exchange and the physical exchanges through the central limit order book that limited only the physical exchanges to that central limit order book. But they didn't quit there. Like I say, these people are nobody's fool. They are really, really bright people. They said, what we want in exchange for the intermarket trading system is Rule 390. And Rule 390 went into effect in 1979, which said any security that traded on a listed exchange before 390 was established in 1979 couldn't trade off the floor of the exchange while the exchange was open. And so between 9.30 and 4, that's the hours the New York Stock Exchange is open. And remember, I'm leaving out the aftermarket. There are two after-hour sessions, one for an hour and then another for an hour. Nobody pays any attention to what time it is when you trade in mortgage. Everybody trades their ECM. But this is where the ECMs came from. Because essentially, what did NYSE do with 390? They created a monopoly during the day where the physical exchange would dominate for all of the companies that were listed on the New York Stock Exchange before 1979. 
And so they gave up a central limit order book, but they guaranteed themselves a daytime monopoly in trading all of the securities that are listed on the exchange, because you can't trade them in the third market while the exchange is open. Now, that's one reason why ECNs didn't fully develop until 2006 and 2007 and 2008, because ECNs couldn't trade listed stocks that were listed before 1979, which is just about everybody in the Fortune 500. I mean, excluding some technology companies, and tech companies list on the NASDAQ anyway. They don't list on the New York Stock Exchange. So all of the big industrial and financial and utility stocks in the U.S. were guaranteed to trade on the New York Stock Exchange in that intermarket system under 390. Well, obviously, the electronic exchanges weren't real happy about that, but it was an effective way for the New York Stock Exchange to create an impediment in the market that guaranteed their dominance as the place where big U.S. companies would trade. That went away in April of 2000. The New York Stock Exchange abolished Rule 390 in 2000, which opened the door for the creation of ECNs that could now trade real companies, not just tech stocks traded on the electronic market, and a bunch of little flea bitten companies that listed on the electronic market because they weren't big enough to list in an organized exchange, or weren't well traded enough that they could list on an organized exchange. And so now anything could trade during the day, anywhere, or in any venue, electronic or physical. But notice what the New York Stock Exchange did. As I said a minute ago, these guys are not free market capitalists. These guys are crony capitalists. What they did was went back to Congress and say, you scratch our back, we'll scratch yours. You want a central limit order book? You got it. But in exchange for that, we want 390 because that guarantees our dominance as the venue for primary trading within the U.S. And it did work. You know, it was a brilliant idea, and it lasted, as I say, until 2000. Now, why didn't ECNs come along in 2001 and 2002? Well, because the internet wasn't well developed enough back then. Remember, you've got to have the software, you've got to have the network computing, you've got to have the wherewithal in terms of the fiber running through lower Manhattan to, in turn, make an electronic network work. Well, that started to develop in 2000 and 2001 in response to the abolition of, two, of Rule 390. And by the time you get to 2006 and 2007, ECNs like Archipelago and Instanet and IX just rolled over the New York Stock Exchange. When you took away 390 and you took away a few other things you're going to see in just a minute, like closed access to that dot system, when you open that to outside access electronically, and you got rid of Rule 390, that's when ECMs just took over the market. And that's why it took them so long to take over the market. That's one thing you got to know about. The other thing, and again, I have a, you're going to read different numbers in the articles that I gave you. See where I say there, 390 block, 82% of nicely, li nicely listed trades from trading elsewhere in the market. I forget whose number that is. Different sources will give you different numbers in terms of the number of securities or the number of trading shares you know, that were blocked by 390. Wow. So essentially, that's volume. That 82% is volume that would have gone somewhere else if 390 wasn't there. Okay. Why did this? Pardon me? Probably not as because I think they're estimates. You know, I don't think anybody knows for sure exactly what would have occurred off the floor of the exchange. Those are wild-ass guesses, I think, because how can I tell that you would have traded in an ECM rather than traded in a physical exchange if yeah. that impediment weren't there? And the answer is, I don't know that right. fact. So different people are giving different estimates. The Wall Street Journal's quote one, Bloomberg's quote another, Business Week quotes a third. But like I say, in this particular article that I read, they said 82, so I just parroted their number. I don't put any faith behind that number. I mean, a good way to look at that is it blocked a lot of trading that would have gone on elsewhere if 390 wasn't there. Number two, the trade-through rule. The trade-through rule is something that you've got to pay attention to, too, because this is what the bone of contention is between NASDAQ and the physical exchanges. 
Under the SEC's trade through rule, I want you to notice one thing about the way terms are defined in markets. Notice we don't have formal definitions for a lot of this stuff. We, in academics, follow the lead of the practitioners in using the same vernacular that they use, the same vocabulary that they use. And the vernacular that they use is decidedly slang. I mean, you know, if you look at the terminology, I mean, things are called what they sound like they do simply because that's how people communicate on the floor of the exchange. When you're busy during the day making money, you're not in the back room trying to look up Latin words to define things like they do in medicine. You just stay out on the floor and whatever people talk about in terms of the way they talk to one another about something is the language that works its way into the literature. And so that's why it's called the trade through rule, because the trade through rule is the SEC's rule that prohibits NASDAQ market makers from trading through a better spread in a different market. That's where they get the term trade through. And you'll see that in a lot of the articles that you're going to read. NASDAQ hates the trade through rule because it slows them down. They can't execute electronic orders. These are in the days before the ECMs, because remember, most orders don't go through market makers anymore and don't go through specialists. They go through computers on platforms like IX that you're going to learn about next week. But in the old days, the old days being a few years ago, remember this freight trading stuff has only developed within the last four or five years. Before that, NASDAQ had a deliberate advantage in terms of executing trades more quickly than the physical exchanges because physical exchanges take time. I've got to go to the specialist, I've got to hunt and punch around in the crowd and find the offset to the transaction, then I've got to do the trade and I've got to record the trade and I, you know, shit, that takes like 15 seconds. Uh, on the other hand, in 50 seconds you can make 100 million trades when you're trading in a couple of nanoseconds which is where we are today. And so the advantage the electronic market always enjoyed, this is NASDAQ, was it was faster than executing in a physical exchange where you had to work with four brokers, four traders, and specialists. And the New York Stock Exchange and the physical exchange always had the volume. And so their advantage was they had better spreads. And so it's like the Miller Lite commercial, taste great, less spilling, right? On one side, you've got NASDAQ saying, we're quick. Our spreads may be wider, but you'll get the trade done and get it done now. On the other hand, the physical exchange has said, we may be a little bit slower than you are, but we'll give you a better price. And so it depended on which venue you wanted. Well, as long as the trade through rule existed, that slowed down the market makers on the NASDAQ. And so it gave the New York Stock Exchange a greater competitive advantage because their spreads were so much smaller because their volumes were higher and their execution time was only a little bit slower. That's called latency. The time between when you place the order and the trade is executed at the price is the market's latency. Well, that latency period difference between the New York Stock Exchange and the over-the-counter market wasn't as big because of the trade-through rule. Because before the market makers could execute the trade online, they had to verify that they had a better spread than what you could get at the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> now, you got to understand the culture of the market. The New York Stock Exchange people are, you know, at one time when you owned a seat on the exchange, you owned a part of the exchange. It was a partnership of 1,335 individuals or firms that owned seats. And so these guys were deliberately more corporate in the way they thought. The NASDAQ guys are cowboys. And trying to get market makers to move in the same direction is like herding cats. They don't listen to anybody. And they're real independent. They are extremely conservative. They all hate the government and regulation. And they're really difficult, they're iconoclastic people in terms of being small business owners that sort of do their own thing and they don't want anybody telling them what to do. And so what everybody did was they ignored the trade through rule. Well, along came this thing you're going to read about next week called the Odd Aids Pricing Scandal. And under the Odd Aids Pricing Scandal, the NASDAQ market makers were found to be colluding so that they wouldn't price at Odd Aids prices. That's why it's called the Odd Aids Scandal. 
And so the idea is when you price the security, you'd price at 20 and a quarter, or 20 and a half, or 20 and three quarters. You wouldn't price at 20 and an eighth, or 20 and three eighths, or 20 and five eighths. You'd price only at even eighths because that widened your spreads. Well, the FBI and the Justice Department got them on tape saying that they were colluding. And it was an interesting story back in the mid-1990s. They gave you an article that talks about this. Anyway, the market makers essentially had to comply with the trade-through rule as part of the settlement for the odd eights pricing scandal if they wanted to avoid criminal prosecution under the RICO statute. And so what happened was the SEC and the Justice Department finally got the market makers by their short hairs. Because essentially before that, the market makers just said, well, we're not doing anything wrong. Go screw yourself. We're not going to follow this you know, trade through rule. Well, after the audience pricing scandal, what the SEC said is, you either pay attention to that or we're going to throw your ass in jail for the next 25 years. And that worked. That got their attention. And so now the trade through rule became a real point of contention. Which is why when you read that stuff about the battle between NASDAQ and the over-the-counter market, the over-the-counter market guys really wanted to abolish the trade-through rule because it started to hurt them after the ADA pricing scam. Of course, they had to follow it. They hated it. At the same time, the New York Stock Exchange and the physical exchanges loved it because it reduced the speed advantage that electronic trading held. And then along came the ECM, which is really funny, is these guys between NASDAQ and the physical exchanges are fighting over pennies on the floor. And then along came INET and Instanet and Archipelago and a few other ECMs and just ran over both the NASDAQ and the physical exchanges. And fortunately, NASDAQ responded. Well, both of the exchanges responded. NASDAQ responded by essentially creating their own ECM, which you're going to read about in just a while. And the New York Stock Exchange went public with a reverse merger into Archipelago, which was a brilliant move. John Thane was the brightest guy on Wall Street when he did that. And they bought Archipelago and then became publicly held at the point where they bought Archipelago. That turned both of them into ECMs, which is why they're still around. They're not around in anywhere near the form that they used to be around in terms of dominating trading, but they're still around as trading entities because a lot of volume moves through Montage and moves through Archipelago. Montage is NASDAQ CCN, Archipelago is the New York Stock Exchange's ECN. Although you're going to read that as ARCA-X because Archipelago, when it was a partnership in Chicago, was Archipelago. When they went public, they changed the name of the company to Archipex Inc., which sounds like a whale to me. I mean, it makes I don't like Archipelago better, which is why I still, and everybody still calls them Archipelago. But Archipex was the publicly held corporation that NASDAQ bought and then did a reverse merger into so that they became publicly held without having to file for a public IPO. And as I said, that's what John Thane did in order to save the exchange by the time we got to 2006, because INET and IX and Instanet were beginning to eat his lunch. The ECNs were beginning to take over the market. And they wound up doing it anyway, but you know, now most of the exchange trading on the New York Stock Exchange and on the NASDAQ market occurs through their ECNs, not through market makers, on the NASDAQ or through specialists or the floor of the exchange when you get to the physical exchanges. But they're still there. That's why you still get, I'm Bob reporting from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Yeah, it's still open. The lights are still on, but the volumes are like nothing that go on on the exchange. All the volumes are over an archipelago. Okay, now let's talk about levels of markets. And again, this goes back to what I said just a minute ago about vocabulary. There are eight different levels of markets. Okay, well, I'm going to run through this. A lot of this is in the book, although I'm going to do it a little bit differently than it is in the book because there isn't agreement as to whether or not this particular